on this Wednesday night, exploding walkie-talkies. A second round of a sophisticated, deadly attack across Lebanon. The fresh wave of fear as Israel declares a new phase of war. And indigenous families pain and plea for answers. This could have all been prevented. The Nova Scotia hospitals accused of deadly discrimination. A warning about online gambling addiction. It started to get worse and worse and worse. Why some people say it's impossible to break the habit. And putting a lid on it. Chips keep chippier, dips keep dippier. What's next as Tupperware topples into bankruptcy? Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. There's been a second wave of carnage in Lebanon. This time, booby-trapped handheld radios detonated, killing 14 people and wounding hundreds more. <laughs> Mourners were among those hit by blasts today as they held funerals for the 12 people, including Hezbollah members and two children, killed by exploding pagers yesterday. Hospitals were flooded with almost 3,000 victims, many with severe hand and eye injuries. Images of the aftermath today show destroyed devices said to include walkie-talkies and fingerprint analysis devices. Israel has not commented, but is known to use sophisticated cyber espionage methods to spy on and track militant groups, and today declared a new phase of the war in the Middle East. As Redmond Shannon reports, the method and scale of these attacks is unprecedented. A day after what Hezbollah called its biggest security breach, another attack. This time exploding two-way radios or walkie-talkies, including at a funeral for one of the victims of Tuesday's pager explosions. Reports that people on the streets were frantically taking batteries out of devices. Alongside the deaths, hundreds more are injured after almost 3,000 hurt the day before. <laughs> this electronic store owner says people are scared as Lebanon's official news agency says some other devices have exploded too. The fallout is global. This Taiwanese businessman says his company did not make the pagers but a Hungarian firm used his brand on license. Hezbollah has promised revenge and fired rockets at Israel, as it has done for 11 months. There is a serious risk of a dramatic escalation in Lebanon, and everything must be done to avoid that escalation. Some reports have claimed Israel moved up the timing of the attacks for fear of being found out. Hezbollah is not the same Hezbollah of September 16th. This former Israeli intelligence official thinks the unprecedented attacks may de-escalate the threat of all-out war, at least for now. By actually significantly crippling Hezbollah's capacities, basically to push Hezbollah to move towards an arrangement, a diplomatic arrangement that will spare the need for uh, um, military moves. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu renewed his promise to return displaced Israeli citizens to their homes near the Lebanese border, but he did not mention the Lebanon attacks. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. The UN General Assembly has overwhelmingly adopted a resolution calling on Israel to end its unlawful presence in the occupied West Bank and Gaza within a year. 14 countries, including the US, voted no. 43 countries abstained, including Canada. We cannot support a resolution where one party, the state of Israel, is held solely responsible for the conflict. Canada's ambassador to the UN agrees Israel is illegally occupying Palestinian territories, but Bob Ray told the General Assembly the motion is too one-sided. Israel says there is no mention of the atrocities committed by Hamas. The vote is non-binding and largely symbolic, but further isolates Israel days before Israel's prime minister is set to address the UN General Assembly. <laughs> 
hit Russia with an overnight drone attack so intense it registered as an earthquake. The target was a major ammunition depot. The explosion sent fireballs and plumes of smoke high enough to be seen and felt by NASA satellites. Residents in nearby towns were forced to flee. This is what the facility looked like before, and this is it after. It's believed the warehouses stored missiles, bombs, and artillery ammunition. In Ottawa, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau met the widow of Russian anti-corruption activist Alexei Navalny, who died in prison. Yulia Navalnaya, who has taken over the work of her husband, accuses Russia's president of murdering him. She also met the foreign affairs minister today and thanked Canadians for their support. I am very grateful to Canadians and to Canadian government for the support uh, that they see that uh, there is another Russia who is opposite to Putin, uh, the Russians who want, who against the war, who want prosperous democratic country. Navalnaya faces arrest if she returns to Russia. There's a major shakeup today in Canadian sports. Rogers is buying Bell's share of Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment for nearly $5 billion. It creates a monopoly, giving Rogers complete control over all of Toronto's major sports franchises, including the Maple Leafs and the Raptors. Eric Sorensen looks at what it means for the teams and for millions of fans. It's enough to crack the ice under the Maple Leafs, a tectonic business deal that has left one dominant player standing in the Toronto sports world. Rogers. From co-owners of Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, Rogers is paying Bell almost $5 billion for its equal stake, giving Rogers 75% of MLSE. And it ensures Canadian ownership in the country's biggest sports market. Being involved with these teams is a public trust, and we want to win as much as any of our fans and um, and we'll continue to invest. It's good for the teams and good for fans, says this former MLSE executive. In order to uh, give your teams the best opportunity to win, you need a streamlined governance. Rogers goes from a big player to the player on the Toronto sports landscape. Rogers already owns the Blue Jays and will add the Maple Leafs, the NBA Raptors, Toronto FC Soccer and the football Argonauts. It owns the Rogers Center and will add the Scotiabank Arena, the city's two major sports venues. Rogers will also gain control over several minor league teams and over the operation of other sports facilities in the city and MLSE's partnership with Live Nation concert promotions. And Rogers Sportsnet becomes the ascendant sports network in the country. It will make Ed Rogers Canada's preeminent sports mogul. This is his dream to control everything in the Toronto market and he has that now. Bell says it sold its stake to reduce debt and transform from telecommunications to a tech company. The deal requires regulatory approval amid concerns of concentrating so much sports ownership in one company that will control ticket prices and every other cost. How does this affect consumers and customers? The company's centerpiece franchise begins training camp tomorrow and expects continued backing from ownership. We've been supported and they're very committed to winning as we are. I'm sure with this... Uh, you know, new ownership group, it'll continue to, to churn along and um, they'll do everything in their power to obviously uh, support the players. Rogers has spent billions to gain control of pro sports in Toronto. Well, it's spent now in ways that brings championships. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. In Ottawa, the plan by the Liberals to give the opposition a chance to defeat their minority government next week seems to be working out in their favour. The Bloc Québécois leader says he is not interested in triggering an election and plans to vote with the government. Conservative leader Pierre Polyev is intent on trying to trigger a fall election and will table a motion of non-confidence next week. Mackenzie Gray reports on the political theatre. So Canadians can vote. It's the moment Pierre Polyev had promised. It's time to put forward a motion for a carbon tax election. Mr. Bazan. The Conservatives will have MPs vote next Wednesday on this. The House has no confidence in the Prime Minister and the government. It's a simple statement, but it needs all opposition parties to vote in favour for an election to happen. And even Polyev admitted it was unlikely. And I also call on the NDP, don't wait for the Bloc to bail you out. And he was right. Just hours later, the Bloc announced it would vote against the Conservative motion. La réponse est non. Yves-François Blanchet believing replacing Justin Trudeau with Pierre Polyev as Prime Minister would be like replacing a viper with a tarantula. 
and that it wouldn't serve Quebecers. So for now, no election. The Liberals passing their first political test without guaranteed support from the NDP, who are cranking up the rhetoric. We've seen the Liberals and Justin Trudeau have let people down. People are fed up. The Liberals and Justin Trudeau don't deserve another chance. But Jagmeet Singh has said he'd be open to giving the Liberals one on a vote-by-vote -vote basis, setting the stage for future deals with either himself or the Bloc, who want Trudeau to increase old age security benefits. Mr. Trudeau, are you willing to if compromise can't be found, the Liberals say they're ready to fight a general election. Even the by election, it, it, it is a good dry run. The, we had hundreds of volunteers. Uh, the Liberal movement is there. That movement did lead to a Liberal loss in a former Montreal stronghold, and they'll be down another key Quebecer soon, with Transport Minister Pablo Rodriguez expected to announce tomorrow he's quitting Cabinet to run for the Liberal leadership provincially. He leaves a, a hole, no? he's, he's a very important member of our Cabinet. Crucially for Trudeau, Rodriguez isn't leaving caucus, so no potential for another Montreal by-election loss, although he'll need to be replaced in Cabinet, with Liberal sources saying, Donna, to not expect new MPs to be appointed to the Prime Minister's front bench, current ministers will take on Rodriguez's old rules. Okay, Mackenzie Gray in Ottawa, thanks. U.S. intelligence agencies and the FBI say Iranian hackers stole information from former President Trump's campaign and sent it to people affiliated with President Biden's campaign. They say it happened over the summer before Biden dropped out of the race. The agencies say the Iranian government has also continued to leak what they call non-public Trump campaign material to media organizations since June and that it's one of several efforts by the Iranian government to attempt to stoke discord and undermine confidence in the American electoral process. There is no indication Biden's staff responded to the emails. The U.S. Federal Reserve cut its key interest rate by half a point today, its first rate cut in the U.S. since early 2020. Benchmark rate there now sits between 4.75 and 5 percent. The U.S. Central Bank says it has greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward the bank's 2 percent target. By comparison, Canada's key interest rate is now 4.25 percent. A bold heist captured on camera coming up the search for these two suspects who crashed through a store ceiling. The Canadian Medical Association has apologized for its role in harms Indigenous peoples face in Canada's health care system. The racism and discrimination that Indigenous peoples and health care providers face is deplorable and we are deeply ashamed. As the national voice of the medical profession, we are sorry for the actions and the inactions of physicians, residents, and medical students that have harmed Indigenous peoples. The CMA says it hopes to build trust and support Indigenous peoples by acknowledging what it calls the unacceptable health disparities they have experienced. That apology rings hollow for a Mi'kmaq family in Nova Scotia embroiled in a legal battle with the province's health authority. The family of Destiny Rennie says she was suffering symptoms of meningitis a year ago when she first went to hospital. They allege she was not treated properly and her treatment was delayed because she's Indigenous. She died after six days in hospital. Heidi Petrachik on how her family is channeling their pain into a push for answers. I can't type because I can't see, but they didn't suggest anything, so I really don't know. That voice message from Destiny Rennie came after the Mi'kmaq woman was sent home from hospital July 27, 2023, suffering head pain, facial swelling and slurred speech. The antibiotics she'd been given, she said, weren't helping. July 31st, Rennie was vomiting and couldn't stand. Her mother called 911. The 22-year-old died days later in hospital of fungal meningitis. Well, she should still be here, you know, helping with her little brothers and sisters. It just, it didn't feel right. Nothing felt right. It all felt. We were noticing things every day. After her death, the family requested Rennie's medical records and were shocked to see notes suggesting, quote, party drugs such as MDMA or heroin as possible factors in her case multiple times. It's just the, the treatment of, you know, Native people, because stereotypes, you know, we're all drunks, we're all, you know, drug addicts. The family is suing the Nova Scotia Health Authority and four doctors for alleged negligence.
The Nova Scotia Health Authority has filed its notice of defense in the lawsuit, denying any negligence and stating Rennie's care was reasonable and appropriate. According to the lawsuit, Rennie's blood work only detected cannabis. The suit also claims a spinal tap was done incorrectly and says Rennie was already in a coma by the time antifungal medication was ordered, which it then says wasn't administered until eight and a half hours later. Rennie became brain dead and the family says they weren't allowed to be with her. And our daughter died alone in that hospital room by herself, no family, nobody. And they can't even tell us what time she died because nobody was there. The family is now planning a memorial walk to honour the young woman whose life was cut too short, they say, and help prevent that from happening to anyone else. Heidi Petrachik, Global News, Sebaganegity, First Nation. Hundreds of people marched to Ontario's legislature today to raise awareness about long-standing mercury contamination on Grassy Narrows First Nation. A community has been plagued with mercury poisoning since the 1960s and alleges the government has allowed the river system to be contaminated by a paper mill upstream. Demonstrators are demanding justice and compensation for residents and for governments to provide safe drinking water to the community. Online gambling exploding in Canada ahead why safeguards and supports simply aren't working. Security cameras caught this daring heist at a check cashing store in Atlanta. Part of the ceiling comes crashing down along with a masked robber. He confronts an employee, holds her down as another robber jumps from the hole in the ceiling. She's forced to guide the pair to the safes, one of them filled with stacks of cash. The men load up a duffel bag and manage to flee with about $150,000. Police are looking for the suspects and hope this video might help identify them. Addiction experts are warning Canada has a gambling problem and it's largely online. This summer, the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction published a call to action urging political leaders to crack down and treat online gambling more like alcohol, tobacco and marijuana. The push comes in the wake of key federal and provincial rulings that made it easier for Canadians to place bets from the comfort of their homes. Jeff Semple looks into the lack of supports for those who are addicted and want help. The sights and sounds are everywhere. Winner, Genio. Is that Jennifer Lopez playing Coin Master? Gambling is on the rise in Canada. Game time in 20. From sports betting to gambling apps, we now carry a casino in our pocket. Yes! But it's not all fun and games. I ended up in a bad situation. Over the past several years, Esteban Ouellette says he's lost more than $80,000 to gambling. It started to get worse and worse and worse, uh, even borrowing some money from family members. And when he tried to stop, he says gambling websites made it nearly impossible. Traditional brick and mortar casinos use a centralized exclusion system, which allows problem gamblers to ban themselves and uses facial recognition technology to enforce those exclusions. But gambling websites, including those licensed by Ontario, are a different story. Self-exclusion is, is only as good as the system in place. This gambling addiction therapist notes the current self-exclusion system does not extend to websites. Each site is responsible for its own safeguards, which he says are far too easy to circumvent. All you need is a different credit card and you're back online. We let tried banning himself from this Ontario licensed website, but he was able to continue gambling with his same bank card simply by using a different email. Permanently ban myself from the site. After banning himself from another site, we let says they even sent him promotional emails. Promotion codes like 50% um, more on the next deposit. It's really easy to put money on those sites. The Ontario government says a self-exclusion system for licensed gambling websites is coming, but a spokesperson couldn't say when. Wanting to gamble. Any system will come too late for Ouellette. He's now receiving counseling and working to slowly pay off his debt. No, but that's great. But he's now betting on a brighter future. 
Jeff Semple, Global News, Toronto. Is the party over next? What will happen to Tupperware as it files for bankruptcy? If you're of a certain age, you likely grew up with a drawer full of Tupperware in the kitchen. The food storage containers first hit the market nearly 80 years ago and became a household name. Now Tupperware is putting a lid on it. It's filed for bankruptcy. Heather Yurks West explains why and looks at whether its legacy will live on. Oh, come to the party, the Tupperware party. Its place sealed in history. For many children of the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s, Tupperware is a nostalgic blast from the past. Olive green, the burnt orange Tupperware that you still see nowadays, it brings memories for a lot of people. It's why collector Kayla Caswell snaps up any vintage piece she can get. I have way too much Tupperware that I can't even use, but I still buy it. I, I can't help myself. Developed by chemist Earl Tupper in the 1940s as a way to use plastics after the Second World War, it was the Tupperware parties that followed that rocketed the brand to success. Because it, it was so new, it required demonstrating how to use it. And one of the main things was the seal, um, airtight seal. Then press down the center of the seal. A seal that became famous for the way it burped. As the nation's first Tupperware lady, Brownie Wise, creator of the Tupperware party, would go on to become a company VP, as well as the first woman featured on the cover of Business Week magazine. Tupperware becoming a symbol of female empowerment and independence as its durable products made their way into kitchens worldwide. I like the way that it was a woman that drove forward the domestic product because she really understood what women needed. In recent years, the Tupperware brand encountered tough times, with production costs rising and sales on the decline. In its filing for bankruptcy protection, Tupperware has asked the courts for permission to keep selling its product, as the company seeks a buyer that will protect its brand. It's sad. Um, it's too bad, really. The brand's uncertain future making the bright pieces of the past all the more special most of them durable enough to live for generations to come. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. Where does she keep all that stuff? That is Global National for this Wednesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is this bird's eye view of Whitehorse. Thanks for watching and hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye-bye.